Welcome to the Two Grumpy Bastards Podcast, where feelings aren't felt and snowflakes melt. Buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride. They painted over ants. Got the double chin action going here. Need to lose some weight. My beard. That ugly sweater will cover it. Yeah, hopefully. Let me know when you want me to turn the lights on on my sweater. For those who can't, for those who are just listening to the podcast, Coop is dressed like a woman from the mid '90s right now. I resent that. I'm dressed much better. All right, hey, let's get to it. Welcome to the Two Grumpy Bastards podcast. This is Big Coop, Ooh. freshly shaved and haircutted. Um, no longer looking the part of the whatever I was looking like. The uh, I don't know what I was looking like, dude. Like he looks like the creepy. He looks like the creepy neighbor that all the kids avoided his yard. Right now or before? Yeah, no, right now. Me? You look like I don't know. Just there's what something almost. About? It's because I have it's a fun bad... to describe. It's because I have a badass custom sweater. Come no, on, it's the face. Come it's... on. Something about My the face. face is saying something like, you know, hey, children, you know, How come on this? in the yard. I have cookies. How about this? That just tells me not to send my daughter around you. <laughs> yeah, baby face. Yeah, I got my baby face going on. So anyway, here, everybody doesn't know. I'm, by the way, that's Russ over there in the wilds of Tennessee who's uh, making fun of my face. That's like, I don't know what that's like. That's like Phyllis Diller making fun of Margot Roby. Well, I mean, you always make fun of me. I mean, I guess I am on the hot scale of Margot Robbie. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not the way that flows, baby. I've more considered myself like a low key Brad Pitt or River Phoenix. You know, Russ isn't an appreciative of this custom Christmas sweater I have on. I uh, made this sweater a few years ago. And I can tell you, I might have the only sweater that can do this for those on YouTube. You're going to really get a treat. Ready? Here it goes. Yes, folks, for those on the podcast, his tits are flashing. That's right. And it's got a custom velour kitten, crocheted kitten on the front. You can't see the kitten stocking on the back because I was always hoping people would put candy canes in there like as I was walking around. Um, pretty cool. Won many a contest with this sweater. It's custom. Didn't buy it. This was a lot of searching around a lot of thrift stores, baby. Let me tell you. <laughs> Coop Sweater says that he and his girl walk around the mall in matching outfits. <laughs> yeah, that would not happen. I can guarantee you or any girl that I've ever dated that would not happen. But anyway, I do take pleasure here in a couple, in a week or so when I do go out shopping. I will be flashing my lights as I walk down the aisles. People try not to pay attention, but they can't take their eyes off me as usual for one reason or another, good or bad. Here, let me leave those on for a while so people can enjoy these on YouTube. When I want that kind of attention. I just walk down the middle of the mall with my finger up my nose. For those of you that are are just podcast listeners, I do really would appreciate you going over to Two Grumpy Bastards uh, podcast uh, YouTube channel and taking a look at my Christmas sweater. I think you'll really enjoy it. I really do. Hey, so, you should. You get to see the the great looking guys, Beauty and the Beast. Of course, if anybody else calls Coop Beast, you know I'll hit him. I'm beast like X-Men beast, so you know what's going to happen to you. <laughs> well, let's get to it, Russ. I got a couple of videos. Um, let me, uh, and for the, and I have a brand new laptop that I've had to set up because I had a fairly catastrophic failure on my beloved HP Omen. So I got a, uh, a Lenovo, which is a high-end gaming uh, laptop still. So that's all good. But um let me uh, let me get to it. We've got three videos tonight, Russ, so we can talk around. Let me share my screen with you. Let's see. Video share. Here we go. Here is the first video. ...is being used in the classroom, and everything should be age appropriate. I actually have something that I brought that some parents have objected to. 
So this is a book that's in some of the schools in California. Florida, this is not consistent with our standards, called Gender Queer. I, it's, some of it's blacked out. You would not probably be able to put this on air. This is pornography. This is a ginned up, made up issue to divide this country. You talk about dividing this country. This is part of the culture war, the weaponization of grievance. This is part okay. using education. Well, We're focusing on math, science. We're focusing on reimagining our school We're system. We're going to get to education criminalizing next. teachers so, and criminalizing libraries. Check out the wrong book. The school. You have had more kids locked out of school for a longer period of time in California than anywhere else in the country. It was the working class kids. It was the middle income kids. His kids were in private school. They were in class. We have one of the best records under COVID, during COVID. And again, you didn't answer to the fact you had what more line learning shit. loss. Ron DeSantis had more learning loss during COVID. Fourth grade reading, fourth grade math, eighth grade reading, eighth grade math. We outperformed you. How's that for a lying sack of shit? Yeah, I Go actually ahead. wrote, I, for those who can't see it, I've got note cards here from notes I took during the debate. So a couple of things about the shit that he said. First of all, when uh, Ron, when Governor DeSantis brought out the gender queer, uh, Newsom started conflating gender queer with gay teachers being criminalized. I, and yeah, that was weird. The only thing I, the only reason I can, think of that he did that was because he was losing so badly he tried to had to try to go to the moral outrage meter anybody who's paying even a modicum of attention and it's not an extreme partisan is going to see hey gavin that's not what the question was about all right so and then his his numbers um were just flat out made up they, they put him on the screen and he denied they existed and then he tries he tries talking about uh you know he tries talking about coat uh co Florida and California were about on par per capita for COVID. And Florida is the second oldest state in the union outside of Maine. You know, and Maine's got like four people and a moose. So it, it's Newsom, he lied his way through the debate very obviously. He was very obviously flustered. What I, I do you get more clips we're going to show about the debate that you want to talk about? I just had one more, and then after that, I figured I didn't want to over over uh, okay. video clip it. I'll show one Go more, ahead. which was one of my favorite moments of the debate. But I, I put that clip up there specifically to show, and it happened throughout the night. DeSantis would crush him with facts and figures, and DeSantis was incredibly well prepared. And then Gavin yes. would just try to lie his way out of it, obfuscate his way out of it, make up statistics, all that. So let me just show one more here. And... We'll get to it. I'm going to have to do this the old fashioned way and edit some shit. <laughs> Ron, Great Ron, natural twice. Excuse me, yep. sir. Last so, but one of the things that I did, I had, uh, I was Governor talking to a gentleman, a couple. Guys, I know. guys, I'm going to let this. To a, I'm going to let the debate breathe. But it's his turn. Let's take let's take turns. So I was talking to a fella who had made the move from California uh, to Florida, and he was telling me that Florida is much better governed, uh, safer, better budget, uh, lower taxes, all this stuff. And he's really happy with the quality of life. And then he paused and he said, "And oh, by the way, I'm Gavin Newsom's father-in-law. So we do count." Gavin's in-laws as some of the people that have fled California um, and come to the state of Florida. And, and why are we why are we getting people to come? We have a 50-year low in the crime rate. You don't see in the last 10 years, we've had a 45% decline in homelessness. California's had a 45% increase in homelessness. We back the blue. I was walking the streets of San Francisco a couple months ago, and I had some of the cops in San Francisco do a beeline to come over to me, and I didn't know what they were going to say. And they're like, we want to thank you for standing for law enforcement because we don't get that support in the All state right. of California. So people understand I mean, quality of life matters. They understand that Florida's doing it right. And I can tell you the numbers speak for themselves. We have way more Let people move moving on. to this state than leaving. Gavin can't say the opposite. More people are leaving. That was one of my favorite moments in the debate. I didn't see that coming when he. <laughs> and, and yeah, Did you watch Gavin Newsom's face congeal like cooling fat? But he had no answer. He never even rebutted it or answered to it because it's a true story. I mean, DeSantis didn't make that up. Newsom's own father-in-law moved to Florida and says it's better governed here. Wow. Wow. What yeah. an indictment. What an indictment. But yeah, we can talk some points. I know you got some notes and we can kind of do a back and forth. So go ahead. Well, uh, overall, first of all, um, I, I felt like I was seeing 
a 2028 presidential race debate preview. Um, because unfortunately, uh, neither of these guys is going to be the nominee in 2024. Um, Gavin may be waiting for Biden to trip over himself, but that's probably not going to happen. So Biden will be the nominee. And as much as I love DeSantis, I have no idea what this mad infatuation is the Republicans have with Trump. So we're going to end up with a Trump versus Biden rematch. We need to be asking ourselves, how the hell in a country of 330 million people are Trump and Biden the two best we can come up with? But I did feel, feel like we were watching the 2028 debate preview. Um, Gavin Newsom, he just made made stuff up. He's relying on people to be stupid and uninformed. His tax numbers were completely made up. His job numbers were completely redirected. Um, the employment makeup was was very misdirected. He tried to claim that Florida was more locked down than California. Nobody with half a brain believes that. And I know you didn't show the video of it, but I really enjoyed uh, DeSantis pulling out the poop map of California, of uh, San Francisco. Um, I thought DeSantis completely outclassed him. Now, there was petty bickering, talking over each other. Um, I heard later that, you know, I'm sure you saw at the end of the debate, Hannity said, we got another 20 minutes if you want to go. And both of them were like, yeah. And then they came back and the debate was over. And I heard that it was uh, uh, Newsom's wife that pulled the plug on that one because her husband was getting absolutely curb stomped. I heard that too. Can you imagine her reaction when she hears about her father? Uh, yeah. Talk, talking to talking to Gavin. And you know, what was funny is leading up to the debate, all the mainstream media was talking about oh, DeSantis is going to get killed because, you know, Gavin Newsom is so good at this and all that. That, that, that anybody who watched that debate saw the difference between a professional leader, a governor, and somebody who is a sociopath, in my opinion. And and I and I'm not saying that lightly. I'm not saying that as a as hyperbole. Gavin Newsom's a sociopath. And and he, as as Corolla loves to say, you're either stupid or you're a fucking liar. Which is it? Um, Maybe both. I think he's just a liar. I, I do I do think. Um. First of all, anyone who was saying that Newsom was going to roll over to Santos before that debate should not be involved in, in grown-up politics because they haven't been paying attention. Anyone who's paid attention to the difference between Newsom and DeSantis um, over the last four years knew that knew, knew that DeSantis was going to walk all over him. And my concern was that expectations were so high for DeSantis that it would be hard for him to match it, that he'd stumble somewhere, he'd say something wrong, and that would be – that's – because to be fair, for the last, what, 30 years almost, um, I've been watching Republican presidential candidates trip over their own balls <laughs> in debates. Um, it's been it's been pretty painful, to be honest. Yeah. Um, the only debate where a, a Republican really held his own, in my opinion, was the 2004 vice presidential debate where Dick Cheney you know, treated John Edwards like he was a, a stupid child. Right. Uh, but outside of that... and. So I kept waiting for it because I've been primed over the last 25 to 30 years for that the Republican to say just not look so not look as smart, say something cringy, stumble over his words. DeSantis didn't do that. This is the kind of candidate that on a debate stage we've been waiting for for years. The only person on the Republican side that I think could match that would be Ted Cruz. Um, and I think Cruz would absolutely annihilate Gavin Newsom as well. Um, I, I do wish uh, Governor DeSantis could be a little bit more uh, charismatic. He, he's, his voice is a little bit monotone, not monotone, flat maybe. Um, and in the era of television, that matters. I wish it didn't, but it did. But on the substance, on the substance, he he annihilated Newsom. Newsom came off looking like, you know, uh, an angry Ken doll. Um, let's see. <laughs> Ron did, Governor DeSantis did talk over Newsom a few times. I didn't particularly care for that. Um, but, uh, it was, it's interesting I, I, that what this debate showed and Republicans need to take note of this, how different it was without liberal debate moderators. Okay. Without Candy Crowley inserting her, her dumb ass in the middle of a, a debate between Mitt Romney and, and, uh, Barack Obama, you know, when you have debate moderators that are not liberal and not looking to choose sides, uh, like George Stephanopoulos, you get a different debate. Now, I would never expect the Democrats to uh, accede to Sean Hannity moderating a debate, you know, in the an actual presidential season with their nominee. But Republicans need to learn to say no to some of their 
the folks that are put forward by the left as well, or at least insist on balance, because it does make for a different debate. It's the difference between, you know, DeSantis being able to show what happened in Florida with unemployment, with homelessness, with crime, and, you know, George Stephanopoulos asking candidates on stage to raise their hand if they don't believe in climate change. I mean, that, that's that's a big part of the format. It is. I remember specifically, and I wish I remembered the question and her name. I think it was the last presidential debate between Trump and Biden, where Trump was basically kicking Biden's ass. I mean, just kicking Biden's ass left and right. And uh, she goes and making salient points. And she says, "Okay, can we get back to race, please? Because, yeah, that's such an issue. That's such an issue that it's all. Yeah, let me get back to race baiting and, and this made up thing called institutional racism yeah there was there was a i was pleasantly surprised by the by the debate not that i thought sant desantis wouldn't do well but there was a lot of topics of substance and he came armed to the teeth with data and that's what i that's what i love about that facts and figures if you folks want to go back and take a look at that there's um the full debate is out there on youtube i believe that fox news put that out um and you can there's other ways to get it, of course. Um, it was it was a good preview. And to me, it was validation of what you and I have been preaching um, since way back when, that, that DeSantis is by far and away the most qualified mm-hmm. politician or, or civil servant to be president of the United States. And it's not even close. Um, he's by far the most successful governor in the country right now. And it's not debatable. And what was just what was a little astonishing to me, instead of deflection, Gavin Newsom would make up. I mean, he oh, had, yeah. he he actually was saying I remember at one point he talked about the concealed weapons um, law that was passed in Florida leading to more crime, which is exactly the opposite of what happened um, or that the murder rate, the the crime rates in California were or, uh, Florida were much higher than California, which is which isn't even close to true. Well, he also tried to claim taxes were higher in Florida than they are in California. And that, that was the point at which I literally laughed my I laughed out loud at that point. I did too. Like, I did too. I'm like, like, you're you're he, insane. You're insane, Newsom. Like, yeah, people are leaving and they talked about regressive taxes. I'm like, you mean like the gas tax? Like your sales tax? I mean, give me a give me a break, dude. You, nobody the only person that's gonna fool is someone who's so ignorant they probably shouldn't be voting to begin with. Yep. That is I it yeah, it was uh it was it wasn't even close. It wasn't even close. And there wasn't a single moment that I thought I agree with you. I wish there'd been more he would have followed more of a traditional um, you know, a uh what should I say, professional debate standard where he would have let Gavin Newsom when he was talking dig his own hole and then and then do the counterpunch. And then when Gavin Newsom tried to interrupt him, he's like, All right, I let you talk, let me talk. Yeah. That's that's debate one oh one right there. Um and he'll get that down before 2028, because I think 2028, I mean, Ron will be back. I, I'm hope I'd love it if he won this cycle. He probably not going to, um, just because, again, what I said about Republicans, you know, wanting to kick themselves in the balls over and over. Um, right. But I, I think in 2028, he'll be back. And it probably is looking like, you know, Newsom and DeSantis as the front runners for 2028. Probably. I, I can't even imagine. Wow. It's like it's like the Palestinians voting in Hamas for Californians to keep voting this bastard into office. I I I I I don't even get it. I don't care how even if you are a serious seriously dogmatic democrat, this guy's made everybody's life demonstrably worse. Even even the highbrow highbred people like him. Um that the tax rate, the corporate tax rate, the estate tax, the um death tax, all of those fucking things, those confiscatory. Look, um, where, how much are you guys paying for a gallon for gas where you live right now? Um, I paid for mid-grade um, the other day, two two ninety nine. The lowest you guys hear that? stuff is at two seventy. Do you guys hear that? All right. That's, that's a more, less, I'm trying to think, more than a dollar less than what I'm paying here. But in California, everything starts with a five or a six. Yeah. on the pumps everything starts with a five or a six uh it's it's insane that alone right there i should i should have pulled up the mean gas rates washington's very very high too by the way because gavin newsom's um secret lover 
our uh, lovely governor up here, he uh, there, and there's a lot of pushback on this uh, climate act tax that they put on the gas that was only supposed to raise gas prices by about two or three cents a gallon, according to the governor Inslee, and it's been closer to 45 to 50 cents a gallon up here. Um, yeah, right now, current average in California is 471 a gallon. A month ago, it was 508 a gallon. Um, but that's for the cheap stuff. It's still over five bucks a gallon on average for uh, premium. And you're averaging in, see, I, I actually know that stat because I looked at it. That's an average. It's not an average by population density. It's an average by geographic area. By location. Yep. By location. So in Northern California and you get over to Yuba County and some of these other places, is Siskiyou. Yeah, gas prices are down. Get up to the Northwest, you know, um, um, what am I trying to say? Up, up, up to Eureka and areas like that. Yeah, it's it's going to be substantially lower. So the gas tax is a conglomeration of all the different geographic areas. So you go in Southern California and you're paying six bucks a gallon, period. Uh, L.A. County, uh, Orange County, uh, those areas down there, you're paying significantly more. It's 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 averaging over five bucks a gallon in San Francisco. Yep, yep. So yeah, it's it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Anyway, anything else you want to talk about on the debate? I know you took extensive notes. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I did right when he talked about California's got no peers and he was smiling and he's got his little plastic hair. I actually wrote the word douchey uh, when he was talking there. <laughs> no, I, I I, have not seen him in that kind of form before. The last time I remember him getting his ass kicked that bad is when he was on the Adam Carolla show about eight years ago when he was the San Francisco mayor and he just got pummeled relentlessly. Uh, by Corolla, and then I'm nobody ever challenges him, and he's for some reason, and 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 there was a lot of personal zings too in there, not just the one about his oh yeah father, but while well, you had everybody locked down and you you destroyed restaurants and businesses, you you and your elites were at the French Laundry. He talked about how all the wineries were shut down except for his. I mean, and and he mentioned that the uh, leftist elites, leftists aren't supposed to be elites. Oh wait, oh wait, they are. In yeah. every communist and fascist country, you have your 0.01% of elites and then everybody else suffers. I forgot about that. That's actually part of the thing. Unlike democracy and conservatism and libertarianism, which is actually tries to make things somewhat equal for people, put people on a on a level grounds, and then they can create meritocracies and they can create their own destiny. But, oh, I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> no, it's the leftism that wants uh, everybody to be awesome. Yes. Yeah. Be be equally miserable because you can't equalize success. Yep. Anything else on the debate before we watch another video? No, nope. I think that I think that pretty well covered it. Uh, I could go. I probably could go to the you know a whole hour on it, but that would bore well, a lot I could of people. Too. So let's move on. I d I could too. Okay, let's watch a, another quick video here. Uh, let's see. Actually, this one isn't quick. Russ, I'm just going to warn you. This one goes a little long, but I think it's kind of important for everybody to see this. I go a little long, too, but okay. Absolutely. And this will give me a chance to feed my hound because he's bugging me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Stefanik, you're recognized for five minutes. Dr. Gay, a Harvard student calling for the mass murder of African Americans is not protected free speech at Harvard, correct? Our commitment to it's free speech. It's a yes speech. or no question. Is that corrected? Is that okay for students to call for the mass murder of African Americans at Harvard? Is that protected free speech? Our commitment to free speech. It's a yes extends. or no question. Let me ask you this. You are president of Harvard, so I assume you're familiar with the term intifada, correct? I've heard that term, yes. And you understand that the use of the term intifada in the context of the Israeli-Arab conflict is indeed a call for violent armed resistance against the state of Israel, including violence against civilians and the genocide of Jews. Are you aware of that? That type of hateful speech is personally abhorrent to me. And there have been multiple marches at Harvard with students chanting, quote, there is only one solution, intifada revolution, and quote, globalize the intifada. Is that correct? I've heard that thoughtless, reckless, and hateful language on our campus, yes. So based upon your testimony, you understand that this call for intifada is to commit genocide against the Jewish people in Israel and globally, correct? 
I will say again, that type of hateful speech is personally abhorrent to me. Do you believe that type of hateful speech is contrary to Harvard's code of conduct, or is it allowed at Harvard? It is at odds with the values of Harvard. Can you but not say here that it is also, against the code of conduct at Harvard? We embrace a commitment to free expression, even of views that are objectionable, offensive, hateful. It's when that speech crosses into conduct that violates our policies against bullying, harassment, Does that speech and not cross that barrier? Does that speech not call for the genocide of Jews and the elimination of Israel? When you testify that you understand that is the def definition of intifada. Is that speech, speech according to the code of conduct or not? We embrace a commitment to free expression and give a wide berth to free expression, even of views that are objectionable. You and I both know that's offensive. not the case. You were aware that Harvard ranked dead last when it came to free speech. Are you not aware of that report? As I observed earlier, I reject that characterization. It's the of data our shows it's true. And isn't it true that Harvard previously rescinded multiple offers of admissions for applicants and accepted freshmen for sharing offensive memes, uh, racist statements, sometimes as young as 16 years old? Did Harvard not rescind those offers of admission? That long predates my time as president. But you so understand that Harvard made that decision to rescind those offers of admission. I have no reason to contradict the facts as you present them. Correct, here. because it's a fact. You're also aware that a Winthrop House faculty dean was let go over, he, over who he chose to legally represent, correct? That was while you were dean. That is an incorrect characterization of what transpired. What's the characterization? I'm not going to get into details about a personnel matter. Well, let me ask you this. Will admissions offers be rescinded or any disciplinary action be taken against students or applicants who say, from the river to the sea or intifada, advocating for the murder of Jews? As I've said, that type of hateful, reckless, offensive speech is personally abhorrent to me. I'm today that when no action will be taken. What action will be taken? When speech crosses into conduct, that violates our policies, including policies against bullying, harassment, or intimidation, we take action. And we have robust disciplinary processes that allow us to hold individuals accountable. What action has been taken against students who are harassing and calling for the genocide of Jews on Harvard's campus? I can assure you we have robust what actions have been taken I'm not asking actions underway I, I'm asking what actions have been taken against given, those students given students rights to privacy and our obligations under FERPA I will not say more about any specific cases other than to reiterate that processes are ongoing do you know what the number one hate crime in America is I know that over the last couple of months, there has been an alarming rise of anti-Semitism, which I understand is the critical topic that we are here to discuss. That's correct. It is anti-Jewish hate crimes. And Harvard ranks the lowest when it comes to protecting Jewish students. This is why I've called for your resignation. And your testimony today, not being able to answer with moral clarity, speaks volumes. I yield back. Well, hey, everybody, this is Coop, the handsome and debonair one of the Two Grumpy Bastards podcast. Not to mention I'm the only one that's an actual bastard. Google that shit. Don't, actually. Hey, I'm here to do a shameless plug for our merchandise. You can find us at twogrumpybastardsmerchandise.com. We got a whole bunch of new merchandise in. I think you'll like some of the new choices. There's some pro-Second Amendment. There's some anti-Washington State Governor stuff on there. I think you'll really appreciate it. New stuff coming all the time. I have two great designs in the works. So please, to support this podcast, that's one of the easiest ways to do it. We're also on Etsy. Yeah, I know. Etsy. Um, you can find our products on eBay as well. Storm King Mercantile is the name of the store there that fronts us. 
And there's many, many other ways to support this podcast, of course. We have a Patreon page. Same thing, Two Grumpy Bastards. We certainly would appreciate you following us on Instagram. Most of you probably know we have a Facebook page, Two Grumpy Bastards Podcast. We have a lot of fun over there, a lot of frivolity, a lot of memes, and a lot of hard-hitting news, believe it or not. Uh, A lot of great people in that group. Also... All of the social media outlets, including now on TikTok, you can find us there. And one of the things that I really wanted to tell you is if you have any feedback for Russ, especially because he kind of sucks, feel free to email us at twogrumpybastards at gmail.com. That's the easiest way to get a hold of us, or you can always leave us a comment or an IM on the, or DM, I should say. See, I'm, I'm so savvy. I'm so savvy. On our Facebook page. So we really appreciate you listening or watching us over there on YouTube as well. And we hope you do both because Russ is something to look at. I said something. I didn't say something really great to look at. Anyway, thanks for listening. This is your intrepid, amazing, and grateful host of the Two Grumpy Bastards podcast, Coop. Remember, keep your focus and stay wokeless. I let that go the full five minutes of her of her time there because there is so much there. There are so many examples of what the woke left from the fact that this woman has no qualifications to be Harvard president, but she meets the the intersectional type of traits that you're looking for. African American female, um, nice hairdo, by the way. That kind of is a leading indicator to me about some other avenues of her lifestyle. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some other information that came out today about that Harvard president refusing to con- condemn hate speech. Um, I like that she started out with talking about if African American were subjected to this type of threat or these types of hate speech, what would be Harvard's policy? Uh, she was referring, I'm just going to hit the summary real quick. She was referring to a 16 year old kid um when uh, two years before he applied to Harvard, who was denied admission because he used a racial slur in some stupid social media video, which he had apologized and made up for a million times. Um, everything about that is scary, Russ. And what it is, is I played that entire video because I want people to understand how rotten to the core our higher learning institutions are in this country now. I was fortunate, I and I, and I didn't realize how fortunate I was until... Um, um, later on in my life that I went to a private Jesuit uh, undergrad university and was given a liberal arts education um, that wasn't subject to any of this bullshit. And, you know, you I, I'm a little older, so wokeism wasn't a thing, but political, but it, it was there. It was there on the campus yeah, when political. I went to UW in grad when, school. Yeah, at, at App State, one of our convocation speakers actually gave a speech speaking in favor of political correctness. At at your school, at, yep, at App State. At App State, yeah. Um, now you didn't hear anything like that at a Jesuit school. <laughs> so, uh, but when I went to UW for grad school, it was a completely different experience. Completely different experience. It was demoralizing experience. Um, I don't even know where to start with this. I guess I just wanted to give a quick summary of some of the highlights of the arrogance and disgustingness and, um. This is what diversity, equity, and inclusion, the DEI policy that is being pushed and rammed down the throats of everything from corporate America to every higher learning institution in this country gets you. That's what it gets you. Um, um, and I'm sorry, um, uh, the representative's name. I just Elise Stefanik. Thank you. Um, calling for her resignation. In fact, the entire board of regents for Harvard came out in favor of her today, even with some new information that came out today. Oh, by the way, about her last two days, I should say, and even more poignantly today. So what uh, what are your thoughts? Give me your thoughts on that, because I'm just absolutely disgusted. And oh, by the way, University of Pennsylvania, I didn't I'm not going to play that video. I thought this one was better, more summed it up, had some similar ignorant, ridiculous anti-Semitic action and she actually did resign she actually did resign so she resigned because they had a 100 million dollar endowment withdrawn unless she resigned yeah so it's Um, all about it's all about the money it's all about the money at the end of the day so anyway go ahead so 
two big points here. First of all, I guarantee that if there was a group of white students who decided to put on bed sheets and march around calling for a return to slavery of black people, Jesus, I guarantee you they would be expelled like okay. that. I mean, it would, as well they should. As yeah, well they exactly. should. Exactly. It, it, it would not even, it, it wouldn't, first of all, it would make national news, obviously. And expulsion would have happened, if not that day, the very next day, without question. Um, if you had a group of Jewish students walking around with some kind of placard talking about Muhammad being a rapist because he married a 12 year old, you know, they probably would be expelled. Um, now, my second point on this is, believe it or not, I actually Thanks. do believe in allowing all kinds of speech, no matter how abhorrent, no matter how hateful. However, um, your policy has to be consistent. If you're going to kick people out of school for the hate speech I mentioned in the first part of this diatribe, then those standards have to apply across the board. Okay. So if, if the, you know, if the folks going around protesting Islam or immigration, if they're going to be kicked off, then you have to kick off the folks who are going to be uh, protesting in favor of Jewish genocide, which is obviously, I mean, I never thought I would see this. I saw a clip earlier today of Stephen King, not Stephen King, uh, Stephen Spielberg, who's making a documentary of what happened on October 7th, said he had never expected to see anti-Semitism like this in his lifetime. This is not lurking in the shadows. This is out front. This is daring people to oppose it. And I mean, I'm lucky where I live. It hasn't reared its head here that I have seen. Um, if it had, I mean, if I was somewhere else like New York, uh, or if I was in Chicago or if I was in one of these universities, I believe I would put a yellow star on myself, uh, to show solidarity, like, all right, come at me, bro. Let, you know, let's see if your, let's see if your balls are as big as your bald spot. Um, but, uh, if you're going to allow one type of hate speech, you have to allow it all. If you're going to clamp down on one, on examples of hate speech, then you have to clamp down on it all. I, we will make sure you are consistent on this. If you're not going to be consistent, then things are going to get really bad really fast. Lack of consistency is how things get to conflict because standards are not routinely applied across the board. And I think that she tried to backtrack and cover for herself um, on numerous occasions. She tried to she tried to do this, uh, you know, you know, try to thread the needle kind of a deal. It was personally abhorrent, but we're. We're committed to free speech. Harvard is not committed to free speech. None of these schools are. They have rescinded permits for conservative speakers for more than a decade. Okay, so they need to they need to stop this. They think we're stupid. Okay, either they really believe this and they're perfectly stupid themselves, or they think we're stupid. We're just going to buy this that they have a bullshit commitment to free speech. They don't. They have no commitment to free speech. They have commitment to speech that they like and agree with. And she knows she'll get yelled at if she ends up, you know, citing with uh, the Jewish people over these rabid anti-Semites that are calling for the elimination of Jews, not just in Israel, but if you've read some of what they've said, Jews across the world, all right? And we stand up to that. You know, it'll come to a fight if it has to. And one of the reasons why all the folks are shrieking and wailing like scalded calves over what's going on in Gaza is because they are not man enough to stand up and fight back themselves. They're getting their asses kicked, so they have to wail and cry, and so hope somebody intervenes on their behalf because they're too chicken shit to be able to fight themselves. Oh, I'm giving that a beat. I hear you. Um, hey, Hamas, I... if you got balls at all, get on the battlefield and fight. Otherwise, just surrender like the pussies you are. I have cognitive dissonance during this entire thing because I was naive, Russ. I thought even I thought even those on the left were over this anti-Semite thing, and I thought they would be the first people to not be anti-Semitic according to their own creed, right? Yep. I I have a hard time figuring out, and I, you know, I might be a bigger fan of the Jews than some. I'm a pretty big fan. But I have a hard time figuring out why in this country they're so hated in 2023. 
I really can't wrap my brain around it. Whether it's because they represent such a small minority, but they have a lot of, uh, I hate to use the word power, but a lot of success. Success. I think that's um, a big part of it. I think because because the class and the classic oppressor victim mentality doesn't apply because even though they've been oppressed in the past, they found success that through their culture, through work ethic, through a whole bunch of stuff, they found success. And it doesn't jive with the current uh, intersectional hierarchy. The also the idea of a two state solution being the Israelis problem uh, or fault the from the river to the sea. Does anybody study any bit of history outside of the mainstream media? Does anybody fucking look at the fact that the Palestinian people have had five fucking opportunities to establish a two-state solution? Does anybody even think about that? Does pe do people really think that the that the Jews weren't entitled to their own national country in their traditional homeland, which they occupied far before the people that we call Palestinians, or as you mentioned in the last podcast which is a derivative of the word philistines which were not middle eastern people at all okay um and go ahead go ahead i'm getting i'm getting wound up and i promised myself i wouldn't stress myself well, out. like i said i'm, wearing a, the intersectional I'm wearing a huge poinsettia on my shoulder so i'm trying to trying to be a, in the christmas spirit <laughs> like i said they, they don't fit the the narrative um so I think it's caused a lot of cognitive dissonance with folks on the left. They 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 think the Palestinians are oppressed, um, and in a way they are. But they've they've oppressed themselves by electing Hamas, and, and folks can say, well, they didn't have real elections. No, they did have real elections, and then the folks who got into power killed everybody who opposed them. Okay, yeah. so mm -hmm. and you know I'm not the only one who watched the videos of the Palestinians in Gaza welcoming the rapists and murderers of october 7th back in with cheers and all that kind of stuff after after those horrific attacks um i also a lot of people folks don't seem to get that israel withdrew from the gaza strip in 2005 okay there is not a jew in the gaza strip at all if you wanted a two-state solution this was your chance to turn gaza into the singapore of the middle east okay you had humanitarian aid you had no israelis there you had beautiful beaches you had folks that would do this stuff. And oh, by the way, let's not forget that for all the grief that Israel's getting, Egypt has not opened the Rafah crossing to the south. Okay, there's a reason for that because every time that they open their, at any one of these countries, whether it's Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, anytime they've, op they've opened their gates to the Palestinians, the Palestinians honeycombed in with uh, terrorists from Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Palestinian Authority, formerly the PLO, they've tried to overthrow these countries. So Egypt's like, you know, hell no, I don't want these these folks in my country. You know, let them let them stay there. Somebody once a long time ago tried to make a point to me, uh, a very bad point, I thought, but they said something along the lines of, "Hey, uh, walling in the Palestinians doesn't that remind you of the Nazis trying to uh, wall in the the Jews in the ghettos of Warsaw?" And I said, "Yeah, except." You know, the difference is here that the Jews weren't sending out suicide bombers to blow up German women and children. And this person was like, uh, OK, you kind of got a point there. Um, it's it's insane. You know, first of all, the, the talk about the numbers coming out of Gaza, they're not getting, you know, accurate numbers. These are numbers given to them by the by the Ministry of Health, by the Hamas Ministry of Health in Gaza, who's making up shit. Now, I'm sure the numbers are bad. OK, because when you intersperse terrorists with a civilian population because these putrid little cowards will not come out and fight on their own and hide behind women and children. Yeah, there's going to be casualties because Israel has to go in and root this stuff out. They have to destroy this. This cannot be allowed. Never again has to mean something. And it's going to mean something here. Um, you know, you can, they can whine and cry all they want. And they, they try to talk about, well, it's a genocide. It's not a genocide. Right? Israel has complete air supremacy has complete air supremacy and access to nuclear weapons so if they wanted a genocide they could do it so either this isn't a genocide or israel is really really bad at it so pick a hole people okay look i'm i'm sorry for the innocent people that are killed in gaza but every drop of blood is on hamas the anti-semites in this country that suddenly for some reason feel emboldened to start saying this shit 
They need to be opposed. They need to be put down. All right. Everybody needs to say, this is not acceptable. And we need to say it with a loud voice. Um, and you and I know a few folks who are kind of hop, who have hopped on that bandwagon. And, you know, I mean, I've kind of slapped a few folks down at every turn when they've come up. I don't know what's causing this. I don't know if it's just some kind of righteous anger. They, for some reason, feel some kind of kinship with, they see oppressed and they think they have a great crusade. Not, you know, kind of for, this is like, this would have been like Bin Laden asking for a ceasefire after running planes into the Twin Towers or the Japanese emperor asking for a ceasefire after Pearl Harbor. Okay. Anti-Semitism is a gross generalized hatred and it's centered around a region that basically is in the middle of finding out after they fucked around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't even know what else to say about it. I know we've talked about this, you know, ad nauseum since October uh, on all of our pa- podcasts, and we're we're kind of beating a beating a dead horse. I know a dead horse when I beat one. That's right. I've never beat a horse in my life. Just to let anybody know, dead or alive. Dead or alive, but you know, and I've never beat a kitten, kitten, kitten. Let's bring it. Let's just bring it. Let's bring this back full circle to the education system in this country. Give me your thoughts on what we do about it. Well, it's going to take a few things. It's going to take a multi layered approach. First of all, not a real big fan of uh, some of these places taking taxpayer money uh, without being held to account. One of the reasons why education is so expensive. Well, there's two, well, there's, there's some sub reasons, but one of the biggest reasons is because it's subsidized. Everybody, anybody with half a brain knows when you subsidize something, the price goes up because someone's like, oh, I can get more money out of it now. Um, the two most expensive areas of our lives are education and healthcare. The two most subsidized areas of our lives are education and healthcare. It's not a coincidence. Um, so we need to stop subsidizing that because the sub part of the reason is the subsidies as one of the sub reasons in this. They're funding these college bureaucracies, these DEIs, these tenure track professors that are basically nothing more than you know activists. They're funding these folks, and it's getting out of the classroom. It's getting out of teaching stuff. Um, now the other way that's going to be fixed, and it's starting to occur because the light bulb is starting to go off with a lot of folks like this is right here. These mega like donors. This? Like that? What? Light bulb? Like yeah, that? that? That that's a nice kitten. All right. Um the, these mega donors have to stop sending money to the universities. That's plain and simple. I mean, when uh, I don't remember the guy's name, but when the guy pulled the one hundred dollar one hundred million dollar endowment from Penn, right. that president resigned really fast. Right. Okay. If if these mega donors, instead of having a sense of nostalgia and wishing for the glory days of being in a frat house that they were never invited to, if they pull their money. They'll have an impact. But until then, you know, people people will continue to do what they can get away with. Yeah. And if they if they feel they can get away with this level of hate and there's no consequence, well, they're gonna do it. I, I think it's hysterical listening to some folks be like, Well, the, the right is always decrying cancel culture and now they're trying to cancel people. No, dude, we're holding you to your own standard. Okay. I'm I'm fine to go weapons down, but you know what? I'm not gonna be the only one playing in that sandbox. You want civility, you first. My my feeling and thought about that whole thing about the decrying the uh, cancel culture thing has nothing to do with cancel culture. It has to do with a code of conduct and uh, responsibility when you are in certain roles and certain positions of authority, whether that's in the institutions of learning or in corporate America or anything like that. Um, that that is no problem, and I actually think it's incredibly appropriate uh, that a lot of these big you know, less less leftist woke companies are saying, okay, we're not going to hire Harvard people. We're yep. just not going to do it um, because we we see the we see the stench. Look, Harvard's supposed to be the greatest what, institution of learning in the United States of America and one of the top in the world. You know, it's supposed to be a point of pride. Everybody wants to go to Harvard. Everybody wants to go to Harvard. Um, it's you know, it's pretty sad when when. Um, great alums like uh, our guy Ben Shapiro are disgusted and no longer even wishing to have anything to do with the, you know, that should be a point of pride. Um, arguably the greatest call university in the United States. And you do, you have people out there, the non wokes are saying who I can't remember who I heard. Uh, oh, um, Dave Rubin. He said, I am no longer hiring any college grads. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to take 
really smart kids right out of high school and train them in their jobs and let them go to school to be technically good at their jobs. Uh, so huh, it's really, really confusing to me because I was a, I was somebody who was academically minded, right. You know, all the way through high school. Um, I got to tell you, if I was a young kid in high school now, and I had the same upbringing that I did, I would be thinking more along the lines of a trade school or something like that, even though it wouldn't satisfy. I'm in my third master's program, as I say that in, in my fifties. So I guess I'm, I'm a hypocrite, but it's at a completely different student. type. Of, yeah, it's, uh, I am, but it's a completely type of different type of institution, obviously where I'm, where I'm going. One of the only defeated football teams in the country too, by the way. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, there, there's starting to be a pushback against degree, degree credentialing. Um, Walmart, for example, just, pulled the bachelor's degree requirements from its requirements to be an executive at Walmart. I didn't realize, um, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's happened very recently. Companies are starting to say, Hey, we need certain, you know, if I need a programmer and I want <clears> someone who's <throat> got a certification in SQL or, you know, Python or, you know, any logic, I don't need right. someone who spent <clears throat> necessarily four years in college. Now there are some things that probably require you know, more schooling, whether that's college or more specialized school, whether that's nursing or, you know, even certain like animation or uh, being a lawyer or being an electrical engineer. Okay. I, I get, I get more, more extensive schooling on that, but if you're going there, you know, to get a degree in, you know, gender studies or English literature, you know, you're wasting your time, but, but a, a graduate with a degree in language literature will have that block checked about their, you know, they have a college education, so they have more access to jobs, even if that degree has got nothing to do with, you know, some of the jobs that they can get. Um, one quick thing about Harvard, and it's starting to turn, it, it's going to take a while because for all the stuff that Dave Rubin's not hiring Harvard uh, college graduates for the law clerks and some others saying they won't hire Ivy League graduates anymore. The benefit to Harvard benefit to Yale, the benefit to MIT, Princeton, is not, in my opinion, the education you get there. It's the right. connections you make. Absolutely. It's, you're part of the system. You're part of, you know, I can get that that job on Wall Street. You know, I can get that that job on Madison Avenue because right. I went to this school. Um, and that's very firmly entrenched. Um, I don't know if you ever saw a, the clip by George Carlin when he was talking about um, the way that the country is run at certain, especially at certain of the certain corporate levels. And somebody was accusing him of being a conspiracy theorist. And he said, no, 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 it does not take a formalized conspiracy when all of these people went to the same schools, were taught by the same teachers, had to write the same papers. They've got the same mindset. You don't need to formalize a conspiracy because they're already there. That's similar to what I've always heard about the, the mainstream media. There's not a mainstream media to buy. There's not a mainstream media conspiracy to bias the news. It's just the way they are because that's their mindset. You don't have to have a conspiracy. They're already there. Yeah. So exactly. rooting out that level of entrenchment in some of the halls of power is going to take a lot longer than you know a flash in the pan moment from 2023. I think the non-traditional school system is part of it too, where you get um, schools like I'm taking some online. I mean. I am hip deep in a master's program, but I still take some free courses from Hillsdale College, for instance, um, that are that'll and Hillsdale College is not exactly a leftist institution, if you know what I mean. Um, it's it's about as leftist as the current school that I'm attending. Um, and, you know, um, Prager U, uh, for instance, where people can get far more educated on listening to five minute podcasts that on uh, Dennis Prager's outlet than uh anything you're going to get in a classroom in in you know traditional american values history economics um all of that kind of thing i think that's going to be part of it i don't think that there's anything we're going to do about these ivy league institutions or these leftist institutions anymore i just don't think there's anything we can do about it i think you would have to literally not not literally let me take, yeah i mean you would you would i Hope that people see what's going on in this these institutions and just quit sending their kids there and quit spending the money. And and I got to tell you, the amount of money it takes to get an education anymore, you're going through that, I know, in that preliminary stage of all of that. And it's it's insane. Yep. The school that I went to, it was um, 
roughly just tuition alone, about a hundred thousand dollar education, which was a lot back because I'm old. And I, I can't even begin to tell you what the tuition would be there now. And a quarter uh, million dollars at least. And well, I think it's closer to three hundred and twenty five, something like that, for four years. Um you know, and I was a scholarship kid. There's no way I could have went someplace like that. If it was up to me, I would have been able to afford community college or maybe uh, Washington State University because it sucks, and that that would I would have been able to pay for that. Um, yeah, I'm I'm looking at I'm I'm fortunate that because I was in the army, I was able to I'm able to use my post 9/11 GI Bill for my children. Um, so I really just have to come up with about two years worth of stuff, um, <laughs> and I'm we're gonna rely on some scholarships as it is. But it, it, the problem is that people have been sold the bill of goods that you have to go to college to get a good job. And as long as there's a demand, as long as the universities can make money, they're going to do it. And people are so desperate to get that credential that they'll go into debt, you know, like the size of a mortgage kind of a debt to get that credential, not realizing how much of their future earnings, how much of the future earnings they're actually sacrificing and it's actually going to re going to retard their their growth because they're going to have to take jobs that may not be the ones that are on the path to success because they got to get something immediately to start paying stuff back. Um, there's no true competition because again, everybody wants to go there. Uh, and um, quick story from my childhood because I mean, I guess it used to be this way when my parents, especially my grandparents, were growing up. Um, my dad used to browbeat me a lot about grades. And if you don't have good grades, you're not going to get into a good college or you're not going to get into college at all. Um, because back pre-World War II, college was more of an elite institution. Not everybody went. Most people didn't go, as a matter of fact. Um, but that's changed. And I've noticed the mindset, the mindset change. Now, you might not necessarily get scholarships, but I mean, just for my own children, colleges are, you know, contacting me left and right about come here. We'll give you the this loan. We want your kid in this college they want the ch these children in college because they're going to get the money for it it's not selective there are some colleges that are more selective you know vanderbilt is more selective than you know ut uh than ut martin okay duke is going to be more selective than you know unc wilmington i get that but just getting the college itself is not hard anymore because they want your money or let me rephrase, they want you to be loaned the money that they will then take that you're going to spend the next 25 years paying back. Reminds me of a, a, a what was quite a huge scandal here 12 years ago or so in the Pacific Northwest, my beloved University of Washington. Go dogs! <laughs> um, He's a um, the, uh, the University of Washington was admitting was there was a lot of in and university of washington is an excellent excellent state school uh compared to a, a lot of public since it's always ranks very high among public public institutions in the country um and one of the best medical schools anywhere of course it's famous for that and that's business school but what was happening is and i know this happened to a lot of my friends who had kids this did uh several i can think of three off the top of my head their kids were 4.0 and you can be more than a 4.0 student, I guess, which I think is ridiculous with AP and some yeah. other things. With, a with AP and advanced and dual enrollment classes, yes. Right. And, you know, good SATs the and, you know, good extracurriculars. They were not getting into University of Washington because University of Washington was accepting a boatload of foreign students, mostly Chinese nationals, because it was guaranteed money. They were getting that fat paycheck from China to bring in these kids. And they got to charge extra because it was a the not just out of state tuition, but out of country tuition, which even, which is even more expensive. So it was a money grab by the University of Washington. Huge scandal back in the day because fuck you, you're the state school, you're the premier state. Your priority school. should go to the states. You've students. got your land grant um, agricultural school on the other side of the state, the Washington State, you know, and that's a completely different thing. But you are the premier institution in this state, and it. Absolute priority is supposed to go to those kids going there first. And that was a big deal. And I remember being really pissed off about that myself and hearing that, you know. I don't um, remember the scandal. Yeah, yeah. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. Um, anyway, I wanna I wanna just finish up the conversation on this by one thing. The Harvard president, have you heard about the plagiarism? I have. She apparently plagiarized, basically took entire passages out of other works and passed them off as her own. And they're still going to keep her. 
You know, what's funny about that is being in a, another master's program where I have to write everything in APA style. Did you have to write APA style back yeah. in the day? It's a pain in the ass. Um, what I hate about APA style is it's it's almost too much effort and it breaks up my flow. So what I do, and I hope nobody from um, none of my professors are listening to me. So I just write my shit. And then I go back and I look for places in my writing where I could probably reference something that I yeah. could make it sound good, like it actually came from like this or whatever. And I'll change and put in a few quotes and stuff. But APA style is very tedious. And they have like now, every time I submit anything, there's an online um, AI that checks my plagiarism count and make sure that I'm not plagiarizing. And not only that, if I make a small formatting issue, I get, I just tiny, you know, like there's not a space between 2011 page 64 within commas in parentheticals, I'll get points taken off. So I heard that and I'm like, Christ, really? The university knows these accusations and they're absolutely true from everything that I've been researching in the last couple of days. And they're still supporting her. They're still supporting her. You'd be kicked out of any institution that I know of as a student for this, but they're still supporting her. And I know why, because it's of course. a stubborn pride thing because if they end up kicking her, if they end up kicking her to the curb for either the anti-Semitism thing or for the plagiarism, then the the conservative side scored a victory over them. That's Absolutely. what it is. It's, they don't want to give the other side a victory, and so they will abandon their principles and abandon their ethics in order to not give that point to the right. And who was the uh, the law professor who was going to represent? Um... Um, trying to remember the story. Um, the law professor who uh, was forced to resign because he was uh, going to represent Donald Trump. I don't remember his name, but he that was referenced in testimony. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Anyway, let's move on. Do you have anything else uh, you want to you want to uh, discuss uh, along for tonight? I know we've been at it for a little bit. Um, if you wanted, to, you know, one thing, one thing that I learned tonight that I, my big takeaway from this is don't ever put a virtual background behind you. <laughs> that is kind of the color of your sweater, because I keep phasing in and out of existence. I'm like, this is like a this is like a Star Trek episode or a Eureka episode. I keep like phasing in and out here. Um, well, there's one moderately lighthearted thing we can bring up, um, and that's uh, I, I I'm going this kind of blind. I don't really know Coop's full views on this, but he undoubtedly knows mine because I'm very loud about them. Um, the the college football playoff is an absolute joke. Uh, it shows that the regular season does not matter, that they are not crowning a champion, they are crowning a prom queen uh, because the undefeated Florida State Seminoles, who I am not a fan of, you know, I don't really care one way or the other about that particular team, but they, from a Power 5 conference, we're not talking about Central Florida. We're not talking about Liberty University. We're talking about a team from a Power Five conference not Watch making it. the playoffs. Watch it about my Liberty Flames, buddy. Not making the college football playoffs. And they gave a slot to an SEC team who lost at home by double digits and then barely squeaked out a miracle against a 6-6 six and six Auburn team. And, oh, by the way, that Auburn team got curb stomped by Powerhouse New Mexico State, like 31-10. Right. to 10. Right. Um, I've been saying this for years. College football is not a real sport because real sports crown champions. Um, now there are three teams that I absolutely believe do belong in the college football playoffs: um, Michigan, uh, Washington, and Texas. I believe earned the right to be there. But some folks say, "Well, Florida State's quarterback, you know, him being out is a completely different team." Well, you know what? Jacksonville just lost uh, Trevor Lawrence to injury. So as a result, I think the NFL needs to pull the Jacksonville Jaguars out of the playoff race in the AFC. Um, and you know what? I think it was last year, I believe, that Brock Purdy got hurt in the divisional round uh, in playing the Dallas Cowboys. So really, they should have put the Cowboys in the NFC Championship to face the Eagles, because we all know that San Francisco obviously wasn't going to win that anyway. Um, I think it's it just shows that it's, it's all about – I think the college football committee did two things. Number one, they – they couldn't countenance not having an SEC team uh, in the college football playoffs. And for anybody who knows me knows I, I can't stand the SEC. I think they're a bunch of entitled inbred rednecks who brag about, we win so many national championships. Yeah, because you got an automatic berth every year. 
Okay. You know, that's like saying I got game because I scored with my 11 year old cousin at the family reunion. Okay. It really doesn't mean dick. Um, I, I think they couldn't stand not having an SEC team in the college football playoff. And they knew they aren't going to have to deal with this issue next year because it's going, it's finally going to become a real playoff system where they're going to go to a 12 team, uh, 12 team format. So they aren't going to have to deal with this kind of issue. Uh, of an undefeated Power Five conference. I mean, because if it was 12 teams, they undoubtedly would have put Florida State in there regardless of what happened with their quarterback. Um, but they they won an SEC team. They're not going to have to deal with this next year. And one of the things with the, a real college football playoff, um, I, I love March Madness in college basketball. I do think the tournament's gotten too big. But what I like about the, the college basketball playoffs is, yes, usually the tournament is won by Duke or Kentucky or Kansas or Connecticut, one of the big one of the big boys. Every once in a while, you'll get a run by a Butler, by a Davidson, by, I remember back in 1999, because I picked him, and that's how I won, won my basketball pool, you'll get a run by a Gonzaga, okay? You'll get the, you know, Virginia Commonwealth to make a run to the Final Four. And that's what makes it exciting is because you actually think that maybe everybody's got a shot. So in a 12-team playoff, they might they might put in a, a, U, a UCF or a Liberty or a James Madison as like number 11 or 12 seed. And they, yeah, they may get smoked on the field, but then you can say, hey, I, you actually earned it on the field. What's going on now is it's a beauty contest. What I would love to see happen, I would love to see Michigan beat Alabama like 45 to 10. And then because Georgia sits so many players that are heading to the NFL, out of Florida State, beat Georgia, even if it's just by field goal. Um, Cause that would just cause more controversy and more chaos, which is what I live for in something like this. So like I said, I, folks, I mean, maybe Coop's going to just annihilate me here. I don't know. Cause I really, he and I do have a basic fundamental disagreement on college football being a sport. I do know that. I don't know how it feels about this playoff system. So Coop, turn it over to you. Well, I'm I, a couple of things. I don't disagree with you about the Alabama and FSU thing at all. I, I, I there's nothing to say about that that I can disagree with because it's fucking stupid. Um, I hate Alabama. Uh, I agree with you on their loss ratio. I will tell you that um, if you look at strength of schedule and the number of victories over top 25 teams, Washington is way out ahead of the other four teams in that playoff race. Washington has beat more top 25 teams than anybody. It's not even close. Beat Oregon twice, and everybody's saying, oh, Oregon deserves to be there. Well, guess what? You're Washington Huskies. And you and I were talking off off, off mic that uh, the Oregon game, the Pac-12 championship, it was close in score, but it wasn't close as far as the fist fight on the field. Washington came ready to rumble. And I love the fact that everybody's talking about Texas is going to beat Washington by 14 because that's what they said about Oregon in the Pac-12 championship. Um, yeah, it, real quick, real quick, the, Colin Coward um, – who sometimes makes some good points was wildly off base here. The the day book the day of the game uh, between Oregon and Washington, he was when when people were pumping up Oregon as the supposed best team in the country. He said, "Yeah, Washington, they escaped with a win at home, and even their fans are saying we don't want to have to face this Oregon team again because we don't know how we pulled out a victory." And then Washington went basically to Oregon's house essentially, um, and you know just absolutely it. Coop's right; it was not as close as the score. It, it, Washington jumped out 17 to three. Oregon came back and took the lead briefly. It felt like a fluke. And then Washington went up by 10 um, and Oregon made it kind of close at the end, but it was, everybody says, well, Washington's barely winning these games. Yeah, but they're winning all of them. They're finding ways to win all of them close. They kind of do the same thing. They, they kind of play to the level of their competition, but they play above their competition at, on all these games. And they're proving it by, by winning all these games. It's not a fluke that it's all the same kind of score level. Yeah, no, I mean, just win. Just fucking win. I mean, that's all that matters, right? And then another another thing to support your contention that it's a popularity contest to a certain extent, and I do have a rebuttal on, on a couple things you said, but um, the way the Bolitnikoff and the Heisman went, um, oh, our, yeah. our, our receiver, Roma Dunze, is by far the best receiver in the country. I don't give a fuck. And he didn't win the Bolitnikoff. That's insane. That is insane to me. And then the fact that, okay, let me put it to you this way. If Michael Penix Jr., the outstanding quarterback for the Washington Huskies, who was a runner-up in the Heisman, had the same stats 
that the Louisiana State quarterback did, but finished with the same record, he would not have won the Heisman. No, he would not have won it because a Pac-12 school, a West Coast, you know, uh, a non-USC, I should say, school, um, with uh, is not going to with that record going to have a Heisman winner. So, from that argument, um, I don't know. I I I can't see that being the Heisman winner too because. Oh, he can't be, you know, he can't carry the entire team. Well, that's not what it's about. Michael Penix Jr., despite being, which I think he was hurt the entire last half of the season, willed that team to win on a, on several occasions. Was the difference at the end of every game in that they won in a, in a close game? He was. They're, he'd they're... make a clutch play. He'd do something. And if his stats weren't as gaudy as the LSU guy, well, the LSU guy didn't make that fucking happen. So there's your popularity contest in, in college football again rearing its ugly head. Yeah, there, there is no position on the field more important to winning than the quarterback. Whether he has a good game or a bad game, like you said, the quarterback can will the team to win. Jaden Daniels may be a fine quarterback. No, he's a great quarterback. But, I'm not. Yeah, but LSU, you know, the quarterback is judged on if they win. Okay, you can throw five touchdowns and for 500 yards, but if you don't win the game – no matter what else happens, the quarterback, the quarterback and the coach are always the two that share the blame on that, no matter right. what happens. Right. As Al Pacino once said in uh, any given Sunday, you know, it's the top spot. It's the guy who takes the fall. And LSU didn't even make the SEC championship game. So I don't know how you give him the Heisman. Um, I mean, a few years ago when Cam Newton won the Heisman, you know, not only was he a great athlete, but he took Auburn from nothing and won the national title that year. And he wasn't even in the conversation at the beginning. So he willed that team to win. I think Pennick should have gotten more consideration, uh, especially given how close those games were and how much his presence on the field affected the outcome of those games. Absolutely. The the rebuttal I'll have for you about college football not being a sport, <laughs> it's a far better sport than the NFL, and it's not even close. Far more entertaining, not even close. The difference when you when you start comparing it, it's all well, you know that the quarterback got hurt. They shouldn't be in the playoffs. The 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 difference is in the NFL, there's this thing called parity, and there is no such thing in college football. Every it varies widely from league to league, from top to bottom in each in each league, stuff like that. So, yes, as much as I love that my Liberty Flames are gonna play the Oregon Ducks, and and that'd be awesome if both my teams beat the shit out of the duck or beat the ducks this year. There's there's no way that that undefeated Liberty team deserves to be in the in the the college bowl championship. And, and you're not arguing that. I get it. That's the thing that makes it a little bit harder in college football is that, you know, you're not going to invite, uh, say, I don't know. I, I if uh, there's a reason that uh, like Liberty, when they play, you know, um, with James Madison University, if they went if they went 12 and 0 and they got into the playoffs, somebody's going to get killed. <laughs> against the especially if you seeded it like the ncaa tournament where you put a 16 against one and that kind of thing somebody's gonna get fucking killed you put up james madison against the michigan and let me just say one quick thing my dream is michigan washington for the national championship because i fucking hate michigan and we have a storied history of kicking michigan in the dick in the rose bowl back in the day and i would love to see washington because i hate that harbaugh motherfucker cannot stand that stupid bastard never been able to stand that stupid bastard and he's a cheater, he's a criminal, he's a bad human being, and I want Washington to trounce on go blue, fuck you blue. I and well, and the thing about Texas, I don't hate Texas having you know been stationed in Texas and stuff like that. And I have a lot of friends that are I have family in Austin, but I hate Steve Sarkeesian, who is the former coach of the Washington Huskies. I wonder how his kid that is uh, being raised by that Joey's waitress doing that he got pregnant when he was coach up here. Um, I, 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 I really want Washington to curb stomp Texas and put an end to this fucking Texas has more five-star four stars in Washington. That's never been a Washington thing. It's never been a Washington's about finding tough kids that they can develop. And that's what you're seeing on the team this year. It's a bunch of tough kids with some really amazing talent at the skill positions. Uh, but overall, just a bunch of tough kids out there who are willing to slug it out with anybody. That is not a soft team. And Booger McFarland was like, well, I don't see it. I don't see Washington being able to hold their hold their weight in the trenches. Fuck you, Booger. You're such an idiot. That's that's well, one of the toughest. That's a fist fighting team out there. And that's why I'd like to see Michigan, because as much as I hate Harbaugh, that's a tough team. That is a yeah, badass I, physical team. I think it's going to come down to Michigan, Washington. 
I think Washington will beat Texas. I don't think they'll blow them out only because no, I don't it has been Washington style all year. Washington doesn't blow teams out. They win. They find ways to to will themselves to win. They just don't blow teams out. It's just not it's not the way they hand, handle things. Texas's offense is is I think too potent to be blown out. Now their defense is like, you know, that's that's water from Mexico running through their system. So I mean, all all Washington's gonna have to do is figure out how to stop their offense a couple of times. But the Texas offense is good, but I think Washington's gonna pull it out. Um I still go back to my point. I, with the twelve team playoff, I want a James Madison or a UCF in the playoffs because again, are they necessarily gonna win? Probably not. But you don't know that until you play the game on the field. And a champion actually proves it on the field. That's been my whole contention this whole time. Who was it? Uh, who was the, the 16 seed that just beat uh, the number one seed in the, in the NCAAs last year? I, yeah, I know. I can't. I, I, I can't think of it. They even made it to the, the Sweet 16, I believe. Um, I, I think that's that's what happened. But, it you know, win it on the field. If, if you're going to, you know, hey, Power 5 school, if you're going to, actually crush these these awful teams, then do it. Go out there and show that you're the biggest badass on the block. Prove yourself. And and you know, don't you know, don't talk about how you're how it's on, on automatically a given when my mighty at state Mountaineers, you know, beat Michigan back in the day. When at state beat Texas AM a couple of years ago when they took Penn State and Tennessee to overtime. Okay. These things can happen. Do they usually happen? Of course not. Like I said, the NCAA tournament, usually it's Villanova or Carolina. You know, those are the schools that that win the NCAA tournament. But again, you know, you do get a Davidson. You get a Virginia Commonwealth, a Butler. You get a Gonzaga. Um, Now, Gonzaga is a big time school now because their success in college sports, success does build on itself. If you you have a couple of good years, you get better recruits. It's a self-looking ice cream cone. I do want to touch on one thing you talked about parity um, in the NFL as opposed to what's in college football. And this is not to, to come down on on you for any of that. That's that's not my intention on this. Um, what the parity argument is, is an argument in favor of something I have argued against for more than two decades, at least. And that is, that's I do not think the vast overwhelming i mean 99 percent of college coaches can make it in the nfl i can think of two coaches that coached in college only one of them actually had you know pure college experience that were successful in the nfl the pure college experience was jimmy johnson um and the other one who coached in college has had experience has had success in the nfl that i remember off the top of my head is pete carroll yeah because yeah. um, he coached at USC, but he was he was at the Patriots before that, and he was with the Jets, I believe. Um, he was so an he had an NFL. Yeah. He had an NFL experience. Yeah, he did. You know, he Nick did. Saban and uh, Nick Saban and uh, Matt Rule and all these others. They get to the NFL and they figure out that hey, I can't schedule Troy State for the first four games of the season. Right. You know, these teams actually are pretty good. I still remember Steve Spurrier, dumbass that he is, running the score up. I believe on the Detroit Lions, I think, in a preseason game, because that's what he was used to doing at Florida. And people took note. So, you know, these college coaches, they're king of the hill where they are, but their their coaching and leadership does not translate to the NFL. Um, You know, if if you – and they don't want to go through what it would take to get the experience to be successful because if, if you're a college coach, like I said, you're king of the hill. You don't want to go suddenly be a quarterback coach in the NFL and work your way up to offensive or defensive coordinator, you know, and and actually learn what it takes to win in the NFL. You want to go from, you want to be Urban Meyer. You want to go from Ohio State to Jacksonville and last less than half a season because you got some ethical issues, mm-hmm. and they don't realize they're dealing with men in the NFL, not a bunch of kids who are learning to be men in college. So I just want when you mentioned parity, that's the only point I wanted to bring up was I think college coaches to the NFL is a stupid thing. Every time I see that it happens, I'm like, well, there's a team that's going down the down the tube really fast. And I don't recall the last, you know, high profile college coach that everybody wanted getting to the NFL and having any success. Do you remember any? Not the two that you said are come to mind. And like like you said, Pete Carroll had experience as an assistant with the Jets, and then he had a 
uh, unsuccessful run as the head coach of uh, the Patriots there. Um, the the other t- the other thing I'd actually add to that argument is that uh, recruiting is everything in yes. college football, and you don't get that opportunity as a head coach. Um, one of one of I think Pete Carroll's blind spots, and you're seeing the Seahawks fade into the sunset the last few weeks, which I I'm not a Pete Carroll fan. Thank you for the Super Bowl. Other than that, you've never built an offensive line. You've never you know, but you made yourself basically general manager. That was part of your deal, and that just really shocked me. Uh, then they brought in, I, I'm just not a fan, but anyway, I know the 12s hate me for that, but he hasn't had any Look, success. I, just real quick. I don't think coaches, I think, I think coaches taking on the GM role is very stupid. Those need to be separate. It's positions. insane. It's insane. And, um, you know, Pete Carroll, he, he didn't even have to recruit back then because USC was its, in its heyday, but he did recruit. And I'm, you know, obviously he recruited crooked. We all know the scandals about what happened around Reggie Bush and some other, other issues yeah. there. Um, and uh, I hate that college football has gone towards the um, um, the NAC stuff because I don't know. It just I that's a that's a that's a conversation for a different day. But they're used to being able to recruit, and recruiting is huge. And one of the things that I I'm actually hopping on with the hardcore Huskies tomorrow morning is that, uh, um, and I'm going to pimp the shit out of our show is uh, oh. my friend my friend Derek Johnson um, over there at Hardcore Husky the the podcast. And um, one of the things I'm going to talk about is that this this class, this this team that you see, um, you, we hired a coach that rose up through the ranks, North Dakota State, and, you know, rose up through the ranks and had success everywhere he went. And now he's having amazing success. And it's not so much recruiting, although they grabbed some amazing talent off the transfer portal. What you're seeing with the Washington Huskies is coaching. You're seeing pure yeah. fucking coaching. And it's it's beautiful to watch. It is absolutely and that's that's the difference between what you see. A lot of coaches like, uh, oh, what was what's his Ed Orgeron? I don't think he was a very good coach. I think he was an outstanding recruiter, but he turned out not to be a great coach. And with all the talent he had, he should have had seven national championships in his career, and he didn't make it happen. You know, um, coaching does make a difference in college football, yes, but that recruiting thing is such an advantage. You know, oh, yeah, Washington's Washington's never going to recruit like Alabama and. Georgia and you know the Texas is never and that's what everybody's oh Texas has got so much more talent I don't think they have as good of a coach I don't think stars Steve Sarkeesian is as good of a coach um I think he's a guy better be out for blood against Sarkeesian I I hope so I always thought he would make a talented offensive coordinator and I was right but um he's having success as a head coach you know God bless him I hope I hope his life is is success at Texas because you know Texas half half of getting the players in Texas is just the Texas name Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and Washington enjoyed that for a while back in the heyday of the late eighties, early nineties. They won the national championship. They may enjoy it again. Yep. Well, you'll, we'll see. We'll see. And we're looking, we're looking pretty good. Um, They made some good moves off the transfer portal last year. Uh, Michael Penix Jr. Being the prize of that uh, two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, he was hurt two ACLs. He never had a chance to play. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, it's going to be fun. Um, I think there's a game coming up this weekend. The first of the crappy bowl games is this weekend, if I remember right. Um, like the Petticoat Junction Vanilla Pudding Bowl or something like that. Hey, my, my App State Mountaineers are going to be in the Mighty Cure Bowl. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the bowl that uh, uh, Liberty and Oregon are squaring off on. It pops up on my. Second. It pops up every time I log into my classes. It pops up. Um. I really wish I get why the Liberty are called the Flames, but I really wish they were called something else. I really admit they're going to be at the uh, they're going to be at the Fiesta Bowl. Oh, uh, you know, and that's that's really exciting for that school. That's that's an amazing, exciting event for that school to be able to yeah. do that and 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 play one of the better teams in the country. Definitely a top, I think, seven or eight team in the country. Yeah, well, look, a hey, App State they play on Saturday in the Cure Bowl. We play Miami. Now we play. Now let me refresh. We play Miami of Ohio. But we still play a Miami team. I was going to say, I was just about to interrupt you. That's funny. That's funny. Yep, you're going against the mighty Miami, Ohio. Red whatever. Hawks. Red Hawks. There you go. I do <laughs> like that Liberty is uh, the colors of the flag. That's their team colors. And they're the Flames, but their their logo is an eagle thing. Their mascot is yeah, some. Of course. Yes, of course. But, hey, yeah, patriotism and all that. Uh, traditional values. 
Um, you did talk about the undefeated stuff. We talked about the only mention I, reason I mentioned James Madison earlier um, was because their only loss on the season came from who? The App State Mountaineers <laughs> in the last game of the season. That's right. You know, it always it always cracks me up when I uh, I do everything streaming now, but I got live TV. I use Sling uh, because that's where I have to you know go to watch some of those games that I want to watch. And it always cracks me up like right after I watch college game day and to see what games are on. And it's always like mm -hmm. James Madison versus, you know, University of Southern Wofford. Wofford, right? And actually colleges I've never heard of before that yep. sometimes pop up there. And I'm like, really? Is this like a soccer game? It's like, nope. These are live NCAA football games. It's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> what they used to call the NAIA back in the day. But uh, well, App, App was always part of Division Division One AA. Right. Right. Oh well, it's fun, and that's and they, all 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 of the uh, all of the semantics aside about what's the sport. I I love watching college football. To me, it's so much more of an exciting, dynamic game than the NFL. Uh, the NFL just bores me. It just does. And you know, I haven't. I did not watch a single Seahawks game this year because I can't stand to watch Geno Smith plot around like some. Uh, it's just like all oh. they were talking last year about how he resurrected his career, and he's kind of falling back to earth this year. Yeah, I mean he. God bless him. He did have a, a nice year last year. He did resurrect his career, but the fact that they didn't go out and get somebody in the, uh, somebody amazing in the draft and all that. I mean, it's like, this is typical Pete Carroll. It's like, he thinks he can magically wish things into fucking manifestation. I think he watches that. Uh, what the hell is that called? The, uh, the, the promise or whatever the hell that, <laughs> what the hell is that shit called? Where you, where you think about it, you wish on it, and it manifests itself. It's a whole, like, secular woo-woo religion. I've heard about that recently over the last few days. Yeah. The secret. Um, the secret, yeah. I think I think he watches The Secret over and over and over and what, and listens to Marianne Williamson's speeches. Um, and look, my Panthers aren't much better. They draft – I was at the C.J. Stroud camp, but they drafted Bryce Young. Um, they fired their – they've had six coaches – uh, in the last six years, if you count the interim guys, I've watched two or three games. And to be honest, only because it came on regular TV. And I'm like, hey, let me see how bad they are. They've lost every time I've, I've been. And it hasn't been close. Um, yeah, I get it. I, I'm not I'm not giving them my it. money. So, I mean, I just I just wanted to see how it was. Bryce Young, either his receivers drop the ball uh, or he panics and throws bad passes or – uh, his offensive line is like a turnstile, and he gets like less than two seconds to throw the ball. But he's only like, I think he's 5'10 or 5'11. Um, and my thing is, hey, look, those guys who do not fit the prototypical, stereotypical football body, they can have success. They can be special. But if you're going to draft somebody who's not prototypical football body, they better be wildly special. They They, they need to be a Drew Brees type. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, that's why you go for the guy who's six foot two or six foot four and weighs 220 pounds. He's got an arm that can throw it, you know, 60 yards down the field. Yep. 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 No, I agree with you. Russell Wilson was kind of that guy that uh, managed to go outside the lines of that prototypical NFL yeah, body. But he was he was a special talent. He's he's starting to resurrect a little bit in Denver because it took Sean Payton to get a hold of that offense and kind of figure it out. Um. But he he was one of the he was one of the reasons, not the reason. One of the reasons Seattle was special for a few years. The Legion of Boom was another one, another big sure. reason in that. But I mean, he he was outside the norm um, for the pro. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't you know a, a Phil Simms type or a Ben Roethlisberger type, he, right? Um, but he had that extra something. Bryce Young in Carolina hasn't shown me anything. I'll get into that he's a rookie. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, rookies don't pop until their second or third year. You know, look at like Peyton Manning and Troy Aikman. And so the reason some of that's ringing hollow is, yeah, Peyton Manning threw 28 interceptions and led the NFL in interceptions his first year. He also threw 26 touchdowns. I mean, you got to have a flash of something. And so far, I haven't seen a flash of anything from Bryce Young. Now, maybe it's because he's been flat on his back. I don't know. Luckily, they haven't panned to the sidelines, and I haven't had to see the Carolina Panthers cheerleaders because, you know, I'm afraid that the the one dude they hired over there, his balls will fall out as they flip him up in the air or something. I don't know. Huh. Um, that's one of the main reasons I actually haven't been watching the Panthers is because I don't want that shit in my throat. 
David Tepper, maybe the worst owner in the league. Um, Jerry Jones at least played football. J- David Tepper has got a shiny new toy and doesn't know what to do with it. And he yeah. wants to make all the changes because he's had success in business with constant innovation. You don't do constant change in football. You get core pieces, you get a coach, and you build bit players around them. And, and he's just – he wants to change everything, and so they're going to be bad for the next five or six years. And even though they're going to have the worst record in the league this year, they're not going to get the number one pick to be able to get Caleb Williams to fix it um, because they gave their number one pick to Chicago last year so they could get Bryce Young. Yeah. Remember when we were young captains and majors and we were so enthused and excited about our teams? I remember the days. But oh, it, it used to be it used to be my week during the fall. Oh and yeah, me too. Revolved me around too. it. Me too. God, yeah, I, I I remember it well. The Washington Huskies were so bad then that I think my my emotions shifted towards the Seahawks. So well, don't you remember how good how of course, good I always loved were. the Seahawks since I was seven. So I'm a I'm an original. I'm an old I'm an OG when it I was there the first well, I, year. I, of the Seahawks. I watched I watched the Panthers since I was since they came in the league. Yeah. Um, and don't you remember how good it would feel the seasons that they were having success that fall? You kind of felt good because your yeah. team was having success. If they they were. You know, eleven and five or twelve and four, and they're going to at least get one home playoff game, if not, you know, a couple. It was a you felt better about yourself, and now it's just like, you know, whatever, you know, they suck. So, and and it's a bad product on the field. So who cares? I mean, now it's now you got Taylor Swift, you know, basically running the NFL. I don't know if you've heard that the Travis Kelsey jersey is the number one selling jersey among women right now because Taylor Swift is dating him. Um, yeah. Don't, don't at some even point I'll have to right show now. you. I have to send you a meme I saw of Taylor I just Swift. Had, I just had a mini stroke. I just had a mini stroke. Yeah, I think it, it was a it was a meme of Taylor Swift, and she's like got something, and I don't know if it's a drink or something. She's holding her hand out like this, and she's saying something, and the thing underneath says, "And then my next words were." <laughs> I hate that whole thing, man. I just do. I just. I want gladiators, not not this shit. Not saying that he's not a fantastic football player. I would never say that, but it's just I want I mean, gladiators. He's gonna have the bragging rights of hey, I've got Taylor Swift. Yeah, like I said, I just want I just want to know what that song is gonna be like when he ends up dumping her. Never found her attractive, so he can do what he wants, and I don't listen to her music. So, it's all right, well we thing. better we better run. Me and my big point setta on the and my and my my suede kitten probably need to. I think I did feed the hound while while we were uh, watching that video. So he's all right. He's passed out on the floor because he gets a gabapentin and an ibuprofen. I slip it in there. Um, nice. No, he he needs it. He's old. But anyway. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. Well, uh, let's try to get one more in before the holidays here. I'm sure we're going to have plenty to talk about. If I do wear my kitten sweater again, I won't have this virtual background. I, it's probably incredible. I, that was a big mistake there because I, like I said, watch this. I mean, there's nothing that nothing. It's. I look like I don't have any arms right now. And then there's the American flag peeked in there for a second. It's this was, this was a really bad idea. This is not going to translate well to YouTube. So I'll come up with a better virtual background. All women are going to love you and you know it. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Especially when you decide to manipulate the picture of this on YouTube or on our page and have me like, "Mm -hmm." well, I'm probably going to be the shot right. I've been trying to kind of, I've been thinking about that. Like I've been trying to get an angle so where that I actually, my whole body shows up in the shot since it's virtual background has got me all confounded, but we'll see. And uh, I, mean, I, could, I, should just, I should just make all kinds of facial contortions right now. Cause you'll take anything that I, that even looks like a facial contortion to put it up there for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you want to stay over after I stop recording, we can take a snapshot. It's fine. Whatever you want to do. So you can look, okay. you, you can look pensive. You can like, Actually, that might be it right there. How about? I think that's it right there. I think we got it. <laughs> All right, man. You have a you have a great evening. I'll get this up and uh, uploaded tonight. Okay. And awesome. uh, yeah, you can congratulate me. I got one test tomorrow, and then I'm done for the semester for for a month. So yeah, I get a month off. Thank God. I had no idea it was going to be this rigorous and it's a writing intensive course, so they're always rigorous. But that's all right. It's it's all good. Okay. Awesome. Well, have a good one, man. All right. So you folks out there, remember two grumpy bastards, merchandise.com for all your holiday shopping needs. We're uh, also on YouTube, two grumpy bastards at gmail.com. 
And we have a Patreon page, uh, Two Grumpy Bastards slash Patreon, or Patreon slash Two Grumpy Bastards. So uh, we would appreciate your help, any support. Um, love your feedback on the page. Feel free to post. And on the uh, Facebook page. And from Russ and Coop, remember, keep your focus and stay wokeless. <laughs>